Good morning and welcome to Words That Matter, a modern day book club. I'm Lee Smith, your host. Today we have a very special show um, with uh, someone I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of. I'm sure you've seen him on social media. I'm sure you've been following news, news about him. Um, he is a, uh, an FBI agent who's, who's been suspended. He's an FBI whistleblower. And um, if you've been following this gentleman at all on social media, you're getting tremendous insight into how what was once uh, America's premier law enforcement agency, maybe the top law enforcement agency in the world, is now operating. The problems with it, what's going on. And he wrote a book about that, too. Um, and the book is True Blue, My Journey from Beat Cop to now suspended FBI whistleblower. Um, welcome, Steve Friend. Thanks so much for being here with us today on Words That Matter. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, look, I, I, I wanted to get some, I, I, I wanted to talk uh, about the book and you got there. It became part of your dream and, um, and that blew up. So if, 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 you can, if you can give us a little detail on your life before you got to the FBI, I know you started off your career as an accountant and you were working with your father. So yeah, if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I, I think sort of my DNA is, as I like to call uh, a system idealist. We, we used to call those people Boy Scouts. Uh, it's the person that <laughs> naturally just follows the rules and, uh, you know, just it sort of takes things uh, you know, in, in the best sort of light. I always endeavored to just do the right thing at the right time in the right way for the right reason. That was just always my default setting. And I, and I think that that's an important element when it comes to law enforcement. We have system disruptors and they're for Silicon Valley. They're for coming up with the next big app. The system idealists are the guys that like to follow the constitution and the rule of law and the policies and the procedures. So uh, accounting was actually sort of, to me, that was a natural way to, to go about it. I mean, that's that's all about rules and following the guidelines. Two plus two equals four, right? Doesn't get any more simple than that. But my background was came from a really good family. I wound up splitting some of my, my early days up north in, in New Jersey. We, as a family, moved to Georgia when I was very young. Youth there was ROTC, even looking into doing some military. But unfortunately for me, in that regard, I'm asthmatic, so I couldn't actually pass a physical. And then uh, went off to, to college, went to the University of Notre Dame. That was, uh, I was an alumni there in 2007. I was a legacy. My, my dad graduated from the same school 35 years prior, which is always fun because for going back to the re reunions, we're on the same increment. We could always go back to the same reunion together. Uh, <laughs> and then was looking forward to a long career as a CPA, uh, hopefully to partner with him in a father-son capacity. But one tax season was enough for me to know that I was not cut out for that line of work. It, it just didn't uh, didn't motivate me to get up in the in the morning, and I had the experience of riding on a train from New Jersey to New York to go and meet with a client, and I happened to look over and see two NYPD transit officers, and the thought just occurred to me, you know, I think that those guys are going to have a much better day than me, and uh, at that point started looking into law enforcement as a potential career. It's civil service, it's civic service, uh, it's sort of paramilitary in its structure, sort of kind of the opportunity to deploy like a military person would, but to your community and come home at night. And uh, had that opportunity. I'm, I was at the time living in Savannah, Georgia, that was my hometown, and joined the police department there. Was a police officer and a narcotics agent for a number of years. And then eventually my, my better half, I outkicked my coverage with my wife. She kicked me in the butt and said, you need to apply to the FBI because that's the, that's the premier law enforcement agency and, and joined the FBI after a pretty long, arduous process. It took about four years to get hired. But 2014 was when I joined the FBI uh, and that's when the, the career started there and they sent us to Iowa. Like the, the, the myth of the, the drunken monkey throwing darts at a map. That's exactly <laughs> what happened to us. They, they threw a Georgia cop when they had openings in Georgia they put us in, uh, in the Midwest. But that was, but you talk about, so you were working, if you can talk a little bit about that experience, I mean, that's when you w did so much work on, uh, on, uh, on, on a reservation. And I, I think that you speak very favorably of that work in the book, that that was real, uh, that was real law enforcement work. I think that what people understand that the FBI does from popular culture, from the movies and the TV shows, it's not really what most FBI agents have an experience of doing. That's the closest thing to it, though. 
You're very independent. You're essentially a violent crimes detective for a small community. Uh, I was there for seven years. I investigated about 200 cases in that time independently. It was not a member of a squad of agents doing things. It was all on my own. I arrested over 150 violent criminals in seven years, which uh, is, is a pretty high number. And it's not because the, the cases are super complex. They're, they're relatively simple, but it's drinking through a fire hydrant. There's just a tremendous volume of cases. And you want to talk about underserved communities uh, dealing with lots of issues ranging from alcoholism to drug abuse to child sexual abuse. Th those sort of things are just rampant. I had an opportunity to come in and really serve those communities and, and get some evil people off the streets. And yes, it, it was sort of having the moment working that in that time there, becoming the subject matter expert and dealing with the phone calls at two o'clock in the morning, which are never fun at the time. But then in retrospect, you think, you know, that the, these police officers for the, the tribe were in a crisis and their first thought was, I want to call Steve. And that to me was one of the most fulfilling aspects of in that line of profession and did that for it, about seven years. Well, no, I was going to say that 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 is a very moving part of the book. I, I mean, I I I I I love your book, um, but I find that an especially moving part of the book because the role that you play in that community. You're coming from the outside, but people need your help. Uh, people are calling for your help, and 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 and, and you're there to provide it. Um, you say that's the idea that most people have of what an FBI agent does, but of course, over the last few years, we have a better. Unfortunately, people have a different idea of what FBI agents do, um, and 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 that may be uh, that may be darker than it really is. But what is the normal life of um, or the normal career of an FBI? What's the normal day of an FBI agent? Well, you need to think of an FBI agent as a government worker, not a special agent, and certainly not a secret agent. Most of them get to work eight thirty. And they're leaving between 4.30 and 5. And that entire day is in a cubicle, typing away at a computer. A lot, of, about half of the agents work on the national security space. And they never arrest anyone in that, in that sphere. Uh, other agents work in an administrative capacity. They might be managing all the confidential human sources. They might be doing something like bomb technician, sort of the auxiliary support roles. Uh, but really, when it comes down to what people think of the FBI, they think of criminal work. That's That's the... The typecast of an, of an agent. Most FBI agents uh, seldom arrest anyone. I mean, maybe one or two arrests in, a, in any given year. That's considered to be pretty productive. Uh, and it is extremely rare, actually, for any FBI agent in a 20-year career to go to a criminal trial. So the wow. uh, the ideas that we get uh, about Point Break, uh, that sort yeah, of right. mythos, it, it just it well, just well the Untouchables, really... of course, Elliot Ness, yeah, right. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's a, you're not a first responder as much as they like to say we're a law enforcement agency. Uh, but even in training, the legal instructor that I had said, guys, if, unless the person puts a bomb in their shoe on an airplane, it'll wait until tomorrow. And that's, that's sort of the mentality of you're an investigator. You're not, you're not really tip of the spear and, and there's a role for that. You're supposed to be engaging it. But the closest thing you get to being the real cop to me in my FBI experience is working on Indian reservations. Wow. Because, you know, a lot of people now we're going to move into what the FBI has become. A lot of people now when they say, uh, yeah, the FBI is a big problem, especially the national security aspect. So we need to take that role away from them. But there's other stuff that the FBI really does. that's important, for instance, it's it's law enforcement role regarding organized crime. And you're saying, actually, they don't do that very well, or that's not a focus of theirs, or, or am I misinterpreting you? You're, you're correct. And, and really what the FBI has now been all about is improving its brand. And the way that it does that is twofold. They look for headlines, they look for what's going on in the news, and they can see if they can insert themselves into that. Uh, and they do that by, recently there was a report that they had indicted four Russians for war crimes. Well, if you actually read the press statement, none of the four Russians is actually in custody. They're actually still in Russia. And two of them, they don't even know their names, but they get the headline and they think Russia, Russia, Russia is bad. The American people want us yeah. to go after Russia. So we're going to do that. The second one is they make up the quality with quantity. They adopt local cases on a nearly daily basis and they use the 922G, right. the, the felon in possession of a firearms case. So you'll have a local law enforcement agency that 
develops and works and investigates an entire case start to finish. And then the FBI comes in and scoops it up and says, well, we can bring a federal charge here and takes it and then plasters that they have stopped some sort of fentanyl trafficker when really it was a traffic stop from a uniformed police officer that pulled this person over. And then the FBI swept in at the very last minute and, of course, dragged the case out for several years so they could hit their quotas, which is really the ultimate problem to me with the FBI, that they are incentivized through a quota system to bring the crime numbers up so they can justify their budget, whereas you would think law enforcement's goal is to bring crime down. This is fascinating because this is one of the things that um, wh why I recommend that people, f among other reasons, why people follow you on Twitter. I think it's at real Steve friend. Is that right? That's your Twitter handle. Look, because you, you talk about this. I mean, you've, I've, I've seen you do this a lot. You will talk about uh, an arrest that the FBI is taking credit for. And you say, no, no, no. There was a lot of local police. Uh, this is this is what the local police did, and the FBI is stepping in on this to get credit to fulfill parts of their quotas. Um, and and I guess one of the things I I I I, I want to get a sense of is you seem to have uh, a, a, a just an incredible view of what that law enforcement agency done has uh, how it operates. And the things that it's done. How did that come about? Because uh, uh, again, you're, it's it's not as if you, you never sat in um, seventh floor FBI headquarters in a leadership position. You were out there working. You were a man with a badge. So how did you get such a comprehensive sense of what the FBI is doing? Or, I and, think, just, and in many cases, not doing. Through a natural osmosis of having worked within the belly of the beast and hearing the grumblings and even doing some of the grumbling myself. And that, that quota system is just permeates throughout the, all the halls and it's constant refrain in your head. And you hear the conversations where, hey, do you think we can get a wiretap on this case because we need to get a wiretap this year? Or even being pressured to open up cases on people who shouldn't be investigated because you know we, we don't have an ISIS case. Steve, do you think you can turn this case, even though this person has no connection to ISIS, do you think you can still open up a case? So that was my experience. And, and I always, this, the, the scales were still up in front of my eyes ultimately until I, I wound up coming forward in, in August of 2022. Uh, and then now just having the time and, and, uh, and digesting the information that the FBI puts out, they're, they're not being secretive about it. All you have to do is click on the, the link in, to the press statement and it's about the second or third paragraph. And it says, according to court documents and gives you a little summary of what happened. And it'll be you know, the, the subject was pulled over at a traffic stop and they found drugs and guns and money and he was arrested by the local police. And the FBI is proud to work with its partners and attributes this work to the Project Safe Neighborhood Initiative that the FBI started. Uh, and we're doing the good work of the American people. Uh, let's pat ourselves on the back. So I, I, when we come back, we have to take a quick break here um, for people who are watching us on YouTube. Uh, when we come back from the break, we're making a jump to Epoch TV exclusively. Please make the jump. We're having a great conversation, very important conversation with Steve Friend. And Steve, when we come back, the, the thing I, I, I want to get into right away is I want to find out what finally turned you. What were the things you said, OK, I, I, I've had enough. Uh, someone has to come out and talk about this. What's wrong with the FBI? Uh, a great conversation with the great Steve Friend author of True Blue, my story um, from beat cop to suspended FBI whistleblower. Make sure you make the jump. We'll see you in less than a minute. If you send your children off to Caesar to be educated, don't be surprised if they come back Romans. If you sit your children in front of TikTok and Instagram and uh, Facebook and whatever else, don't be surprised when your, come, your children come back uh, distrustful of your faith, of the concept of family, uh, hating the nation that you live in, and, and, and a whole host of other things that defy truth and beauty and goodness. After all, God gives children to parents, not to iPods uh, or iPads, and not to government institutions or even churches. So let's tell our kids the stories and the parables that produce blessing and protection and character. We need to start on our knees and make sure that we're the ones who are the primary storytellers in our children's lives. I am hoping, together with Brave Books, to make the new Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Think timeless, classic, moral values embedded in lessons that children will uh, benefit from today, 
only greatly modernized with high energy, hilarious dialogue, beautiful animated stories about the sacredness of life, about the First and Second Amendment, about the dangers of socialism, about love, kindness, joy, and peace, about humility, about telling the truth and discerning error from uh, reality in news headlines. Watch us exclusively on Epoch TV and uh, get the rest of this great conversation with the great Kirk Cameron. Thank you so much.